Thank you everyone for joining this session. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor that uh, we have uh, these two fantastic experts joining uh, live from Sweden and Switzerland. Um, uh, this is, I believe, the fifth uh, workshop uh, webinar we are hosting uh, since the pandemic has started. And uh, it is interesting to feature experts from different uh, sectors. Uh, this one is uh, into blockchain and fintech, and um, we are happy to have Effie Pilarino and Dastyanax uh, Kanakaikis, uh, who will be sharing with us, first of all, who they are, and uh, share their views on the future, the trends they are forecasting for the future of the sector. So let's start with uh, introducing ourselves. Uh, my name is Veroniki. I'm uh, a team member of Reload Grace uh, for the past three years. And um, Effie, would you like first of all to share a few things about yourself? Thank you, Veroniki. Thank you for having us. And uh, it was a great pleasure that you reached out and I understood a little bit uh, better uh, what the Reload Greece is um, uh, doing, uh, which is uh, wonderful. So my name is Efi Pilarinu. I am from uh, Greece, from the island of Zakynthos. I have a, a very traditional uh, financial background. I, I, I joined Wall Street after my studies, mathematics in Greece and, and a PhD in finance in the US. I worked on Wall Street for 10 years in fixed income structured products in New York. And then I moved into the hedge fund industry. I've spent a couple of years teaching in Canada at McGill University. And the last six years I've been uh, living and working in Switzerland and I'm focused on fintech. I have become an influencer and a thought leader. I create a lot of content and I work with companies both on the business side, especially focused on partnerships, but also as uh, an advisor and independent thought leader. So obviously being in Switzerland has given me the opportunity to see the blockchain opportunity early on as we have a large ecosystem here and we'll be talking about that tonight um, with uh, my good friend Asta Yanax and uh, uh, his wonderful uh, blockchain in finance venture. So I guess I hand it over to you. <laughs> what a great introduction, thank you Effie. So I'm Asta Yanax, I'm the co-founder uh, and CEO of Norblock, a company specializing on regulatory applications harnessing the power of blockchain technology. So actually not looking at the crypto space, but more about enterprise blockchain. My background is actually advising financial institutions uh, through my time in BCG and McKinsey for many years, or working for them. Uh, probably the most infamous of all of them, Lehman Brothers, for a short period before it went bankrupt in London. And uh, what, even though my experience with the space started in 2016 going more into crypto, because I was actually, I was acting CEO and chairman of the first company that issued an exchange traded note mirroring Bitcoin uh, value. Uh, I shortly afterwards left and started Noblock. And essentially, very much work around enterprise blockchain and how the technology can be used in areas other than cryptocurrencies. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Stianex. And um, it looks like you're both uh, experts in the field. That's why we thought it would be interesting to, to share your views with the audience. And uh, Stianex as an entrepreneur and Tefi herself as an advisor bring different values on the table. So I would like to start uh, this discussion with Effie. Um, as you very well mentioned uh, before, uh, most of us have uh, come across uh, to blockchain approximately a few years ago due to the also controversial, uh, uh, allow me to say, discussions around cryptocurrencies. Um, the sector itself has progressed a lot over the past few years uh, with the rise of stable coins and the interest of the banking sector into it. Uh, we would love to hear uh, more from you on that perspective, uh, if, uh, if this with, is possible, Effie. With pleasure. But I have to ask you something. 
<laughs> is whether or not to call us experts. Because as you, th as you said, you know, this is a space that is evolving. It's a space that, uh, in a way, we can argue it's uh, uh, trying to find uh, product market fit. What is the killer, if you want, uh, use case, I guess, the markets are always looking for either unicorns or, you know, big bang for your buck and, and killer applications. And we're not there yet. Uh, I mean, I must say that in my opinion, um, uh, the blockchain principles and, and what um, the narrative uh, um, uh, that it uh, stands for, which is the true innovation, has actually succeeded. Uh, so, having said that, um, that there's, as you know, many uh, attempts and many use cases, even during this crisis, you know, the COVID-19 uh, crisis, we saw um, uh, and we're still seeing attempts to use uh, blockchain for tracing apps and, and you know, in, in that realm. Uh, but, um, of course, blockchain uh, has inherently uh, different social and political aspects to it when we, we, we attempt to uh, use it in um, either an enterprise or for governance or for whatever use case. So it becomes a complicated issue. So in that sense, that's why I started off saying don't call us experts because it's a little bit um, uh, dangerous. Uh, I must say that I have a good understanding, but um, I can uh, spend half an hour to tell you where I think uh, that I understand and where I'm clear that I do not uh, know, you know, uh, certain uh, parts. So, what you said, Veronique, is very true that most people came across blockchain because of cryptocurrencies. And these are our animal spirits, right? You know, uh, we, we are alert to something that trades, that moves, and especially if the moves are as impressive, either to the upside or to the downside, as uh, cryptocurrencies uh, have been. But of course, as as Yanax will also talk about more extensively, this is not what blockchain is only about. Um, and I like to make two distinctions. I like to think of it as an infrastructure for all sorts of possible use cases, be it, you know, um, uh, um, systems for voting for for governance, e even in the political sense, that's kind of one extreme over to uh, how science is, is done, how um, people um, uh, collaborate in the music world, in, in e-commerce, there's so many applications. If we, if we take what's going on in the finance industry beyond the cryptocurrencies, I think the biggest um, development that is here to stay, that is clear, is um, the stablecoin uh, growth and, and development. And um, it's very interesting because it started off uh, by a, a couple of uh, stablecoins, and I would say namely one, Tether, which is uh, um, a dollar-backed coin, stable coin. So basically, when you buy Tether, um, it is backed one to one by uh, the U.S. dollar. And I'm not going to get into any discussion about um, whether that's actually the case uh, or not. But uh, let's take it um, as a given. And um, the stable coin has been used really as what is called an on-ramp and an off-ramp into the crypto world. So if somebody wants to, to buy today, um, you know, some cryptocurrency, the easiest and fastest way is if you own already Tether or some such 
um, uh, coin because then you can nearly instantly, so to speak, on your app buy the 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 cryptocurrency that you want um, to buy. Whereas if I want to send my Swiss francs or my euros to buy uh, um, um, a crypto coin, then it's going to take quite a while to wire that, to get it to the crypto exchange and so on. So that was the first use of these stable coins. So in a way you could say, okay, who cares about all this? This is all again about trading crypto. I'm not interested. And the truth of the matter is that the market showed that there's another um, fit, if you want the product market fit for sta stable coins. And this is around payments. And payments, I mean, no matter how we evolve, is definitely core to any economy. There's no, you know, going around that. So even the payments are core, the question is, has blockchain, is blockchain going to change this? Of course, that was Bitcoin's principle, you know, peer-to-peer -peer exchange. We are doubting whether that's good for payments, but now with stable coins, we are less doubtful because it seems like it could be a good use case where we use stable coins and I can send you dollars or euros or Swiss francs if we have a, a Swiss franc stable coin, which by the way we do. Um, and I can send it instantly. I can see it on my app, on my, uh, um, you know, whatever um, uh, e-banking, if you want, I have and see uh, that it goes not only fast, but where it is, how long it takes and, and so on which is not the case with any other uh, payment. And actually, um, it's interesting, uh, just last week, one of the more aggressive um, banks in, in Liechtenstein, which has also been quite progressive in terms of um, uh, adopting a very broad and non-restrictive uh, um, regulatory framework, the blockchain act and, and therefore has fostered uh, some innovation there. Uh, one of the banks there, uh, Bank Freak, um, ha has listed one of the um, dollar stable coins, uh, the circle one, uh, the USDC, and um, is enabling their clients, corporate or not, to make payments through that stable currency, which again means um, uh, a different process, which is much more transparent, much more auditable, uh, much faster and efficient. So, that, that is a very good uh, de de description to an uh, introduction, essentially, for, for most uh, of us, I, I guess. Um, perhaps, uh, Astayanax, you could share a little bit from your perspective, uh, because you have founded a company, Norblock, um, and um, essentially um, you are enabling individuals, organizations, and regulation regulators to effectively manage and securely share the and know your customer data. Mm -hmm. uh, so would you like to share a few things more about what you do and how uh, this complements what Effie mentioned to the scene? Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. So what do we do at Norblock? What we do is essentially we try to break the silos of regulated data. Regulated data is any piece of data that has legal implications and legal significance. For example, your identity, your health records, uh, licenses from governments, etc. These are all, we consider them regulated data. Right now, they reside in silos. I'll give you a very brief example. If you go to a bank and you onboard the bank, give your identity. They create a file for you, which is called the Know Your Customer File. They have to do this so you don't launder money, or if you do, they know who you are and then they can actually report you to the authorities. Now, 
What happens today is that you do this with your bank. Typically, we don't have just one banking relationship, so you do it with another bank. You do it with your mobile operator. Mm -hmm. You do it with your utilities companies. So essentially, it's time as a customer, you have to collect your data and give it to entities to validate it. So there's enormous duplication of efforts as a customer to do this. Mm -hmm. All the entities that receive your data, they have to validate it. So they validate it in silos. And if one of them does a bad job in validating it, they will never find out. They will have stale, out-of-date data. So what we do is that what we say, let's create an ecosystem where as a customer, I can create a file, a KYC file in this case, I can share with one bank, the bank validates the file and then places it in an ecosystem. And then if I want to use that file with other participants in that ecosystem, I can just give my consent as an owner of the data and then that is shared with other banks or institutions. And the recipients don't have to validate it again because they can see, to the same extent at least, because they can see that another part in the ecosystem has validated the data. That's essentially what we do uh, in Norblock. And we've actually, we started this application if, when blockchain uh, started becoming really popular back in 2015, 2016, the UK government came up with a very long report, very well-written actually report, with the different use cases of blockchain technology. Clearly, crypto was one of the key areas that they basically uh, reported as being a, a great application. Another one was know your customer. So essentially, this data exchange that I just described. And we piloted the solution for many years, and actually now we're the first ones in the world that have it in production in the United Arab Emirates with eight institutions. How it practically works? You can go, you can register your company with the corporate registry in that country. Then you can select out of a list of banks that you would like to start a relationship with. Once you select one bank, then the validated data you provided to the corporate registry and the corporate registry has checked is pushed on that bank and you open a bank account in minutes. If you change any data with the bank or the corporate registry, the other party finds out. So this is something that actually right now is very much in use, and that's what we're doing in our blog. Essentially around allowing regulated data to have one version of truth and to neutralize efforts to validate it across institutions, but also within institutions. Let's say large banks between HSBC, London, HSBC, Dubai. So these are also cases where we have duplication of efforts. And they, they don't mind having an external uh, platform um doing this, facilitating this essentially, you mean they are happy to use a third party platform? <laughs> so actually, that, that's a very good question. The, the key thing about what we do is that to put it plainly and bluntly, we provide the piping. So essentially, we connect the silos as they exist today, but Norblock does not store any data, does not process any data. We just make sure that these silos have the same version of data, and then there's an immutable log of who did what on these silos of data. But as Norblock, we do not store any data. That is so very who, interesting. Who owns the data? I'm sure you are asked that question all the time. <laughs> and it's a big discussion among those that are considering to, to participate, right? Of course. So actually, who owns the data is the customer of the bank. Okay. Who owns the validating stamp? on the data is the bank that validated the data. Right, right, very interesting. So, so, so it's interesting to see, and we'll come back to Asaya next uh, on, uh, on that note. Uh, I would like to ask you, Effie, um, a question in regards to a report you have started producing. Um, you have, um, uh, from your expertise, you have seen that uh, blockchain is now used into wealth management as well, right? Yes. Definitely. I mean, it's, it's early days, but um, we see um, the, the effect and it, it's in different parts of uh, what I call the, the entire wealth management uh, process. Of course, a part of this is uh, to, to think of cryptocurrencies or any other digital asset as a new alternative asset class that can be part of a portfolio, whatever it is. I mean, 
we can say you should uh, have an allocation of 1% or 10%, but clearly it is becoming an alternative asset class. So in that sense, it, it, it is, you know, influencing wealth management, but also in, in many other different ways. One of the most important ones, I think, has to do with uh, how financial securities, whatever they are, whether they are equities, bonds, funds, whatever they are, there is a whole administration um, uh, around them, right? Mm -hmm. Where are they registered? How are they cleared? How are they settled? How are they, are they administered, right? And in that, part there is a very significant role for blockchain to play as an infrastructure we already have some use cases uh, one uh, one in london um, definitely callastone is a company that is um, quite a leader in the mutual fund administration and they are using uh, blockchain as an infrastructure to facilitate that and make it much more efficient and transparent. And also there's uh, other companies in Luxembourg, which is obviously a very big financial hub that are also working on using blockchain as uh, an infrastructure. And I can go on and on and talk about this. I'd only like to add here that on the more sort of emerging trends on how wealth management may change because of blockchain, we have the whole space of DeFi, which is really decentralized finance. And that is a whole new way of um, uh, thinking of wealth management, which has to do, for example, with staking. So staking, you know, your, your holdings, whether they are cryptocurrencies or whatever uh, tokens they are and, and earning interest and uh, borrowing and lending without intermediaries and the whole asset management um, um, uh, structure and creating financial contracts powered by blockchain. So, we're starting to see these um, and um, I'm actually working on a report that um, is going to be an annual uh, report that is really focused on this aspect of what is blockchain's impact um, on wealth management. We are uh, going to start this report profiling about a dozen of companies in different areas that are uh, involved in, in changing this space and also with a focus on their insights. Where do they see the market now? What are the challenges? And how do you see them going forward? Uh, because it is important to include that because the market is not mature. It's not, you know, the dominant technology, obviously much like what Astayanax was saying with North, nor block, it's, it's not the dominant technology that is used by, by KYC, but these things change in, in, in uh, uh, rhythms that we can never pr predict. We always think linearly about innovation. So that's um, really what uh, uh, I'm, I'm working on right now. It's, it's so interesting to see the different sectors uh, getting involved. Before we move on and move, move ahead, I would like to share with also the audience uh, watching us live from Facebook. If you have any questions, feel free to ask away and uh, we will um, include them here on the chat for our speaker's reference. Um, uh, on another note, we're going to have a networking session after this discussion. Uh, for 30 minutes into breakout rooms. We have named them after the favorite cities of ours uh, in tech, from Sengen to Silicon Valley, uh, London, and many more. Uh, we have also Stockholm and uh, Zurich into the 
into these uh, breakout rooms uh, honoring our speakers. So, <laughs> can um, I go to Stockholm and as Diana comes to the Zurich room? You, you, you will switch. <laughs> So, um, I would like to ask you, Astayanex, following uh, Effie's uh, points on wealth management, because we see uh, how the private sector works with blockchain, and now um, there is a lot of discussion around the EU and governments themselves that are getting uh, more and more interested in regulating and finally deploying blockchain technology as a new infrastructure for security. So, could you please uh, tell us uh, what your forecasts are, as well as what are the benefits and perhaps hidden risks uh, you see for the societies and its citizens? Of course. So, it's uh, looking back in 2016, the interest of governments when it comes to blockchain technology is actually to find out where, <coughs> excuse me, it could be applied. Now, as we move forward, say the interest of governments into a technology which is used to disintermediate transactions and in a way take governments or central banks etc out of the equation it's quite an oxymoron nevertheless they do believe that and rightly so that this should be part of this effort so i would say from at least from what i see the main focus right now is very much around central bank uh, cryptocurrencies this is where governments really have made a lot of strides and they're really putting a lot of effort there and uh, you have uh, actually in sweden the central bank here in sweden has been looking into a crypto based uh, currency that's going to be issued by the central bank here and used by uh, citizens here in sweden so the focus largely on cryptocurrencies issued by central banks when it comes to other areas where for example sharing of regulated data or trade finance these are not areas that typically governments play a big part. Nevertheless, these are areas where governments can actually have a node where they oversee, they regulate the ecosystem. So typically over there, what they try to do is initiate a dialogue or participate in a dialogue. Where you have the central bank issued cryptocurrencies, this is very much leading the dialogue. Now, going forward, I mean, you, have a lot of, um, you have a lot of efforts from EU to basically catch up. In the space I and mean, you have the EU observe, blockchain observatory where they try you know, to map all the different uh, activities and implementations of blockchain technology in the EU. You have many working groups that they try to create protocols and they try to create rules around how blockchain technology could be used. I think that with the, my personal view, my personal humble non-expert but practitioner's view is that uh, governments will essentially play a big part when it comes to cryptocurrencies issued by central banks, but in terms of protocols, in terms of all other applications of blockchain technology, the private sector will be the one that's going to lead the innovation. And essentially the market will dictate the standards eventually. That's my personal view. Now the pros and cons. The pros and cons is that essentially when you look into blockchain technology, blockchain technology is great because this intermediates. At the same time, blockchain technology is technology that has an immutable log of, log of actions. So for example, if you take Bitcoin, <coughs> the most elementary um, blockchain form out there, you have a sequence of transactions that basically you know exactly from the moment the currency one Bitcoin was created, where it was actually used, to which wallets, etc. So there's a lot of transparency there. The transparency is also coupled with pseudonymity because you do not know the wallets, who owns the wallets, where these bitcoins go, come and go. Nevertheless, if you have a central bank issued cryptocurrency, the level of pseudonymity and the level of transparency is actually dictated by the central bank. And this is both uh, an advantage and a disadvantage. So in many cases where we have uh, governments that are actually they're not that benevolent or as benevolent as a government should be, that could be used to even control spending, to control consumption, and to create data sets that governments can use to control populations. So it's a really a double-edged sword uh, blockchain technology and can, it can have many great applications but also many uh, malevolent applications. But as Tayanax, that's the case with everything, right? Even all the scientific discoveries, right? That 
you know, of the past. Yes, it's the question true. of how we people uh, use it. And I think that we're going to have a great opportunity with the soon uh, ready launch of the, the Chinese uh, central bank of their uh, stable coin, which is ready, it seems, by year end that, that their stable coin is going to be in the market. They've already started uh, beta testing in a closed circle. So this is going to be one of the big, you know, um, uh, uh, applications that everybody will be watching, the, the DCEP uh, application. And as Astayanak says, you know, how will, will they control international trade and, and retail domestic spending if they're using uh, the DSE in their economy, it will be seen. And then we have the Libra stable coins to watch when they come to market, which are going to be pegged to single currencies instead of baskets. And there, it's a very interesting case because essentially it's more about whether it can be used to change e-commerce and advertising. Because if you think of it, Facebook is an advertising business and maybe it will also become an e-commerce business. And that is where we will see where the, whether the stable coins beyond payments will also change the way advertising and e-commerce um, works. So lots of exciting things ahead of us. That is very true, that is very true. Um, so perhaps it is worth um, moving forward with the questions from our audience. So uh, I see there are some uh, interesting ones. Let's start with the question from Nico Sikas. Um, it is a kickoff question for both speakers. So uh, if you can briefly uh, answer both of you, uh, what is in your opinion uh, one hand, the main negative asymmetry danger of blockchain faces uh, that blockchain faces, and on the other hand, what is the key positive uh, opportunity for blockchain? Perhaps it is something that we touched upon uh, earlier. I don't know if you would like to um, add something more. Is the question about? What, the threats that the blockchain? threat the, the threat the danger and the opportunity uh, of uh, blockchain as technology I guess there's if I quickly answer this one is at the core of blockchain technology is this inter, this intermediation which is both an opportunity and a huge threat Right now, the intermediaries that we have in life, whether these are central banks, whether these are actually commercial banks, whether these are legal systems, they're there for a reason, to instill, to instill a sense of order and, uh, and justice in many ways. Now, if you take them out of the equation, you can do so when these have failed to provide the service that they required, but in many cases, you can take them out and the result may be worse from the one that you had before because you realize that they actually they were providing a service to begin with. So this intermediation for me is actually a key thing that can be both good and bad, both an opportunity, but also a downside of using blockchain technology. I, 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 I'd like to add with that, and I, I totally agree that I think, you know, the technologies that we have uh, today across the board, and it's not only in finance, um, are, you know, have been hugely beneficial but the, it's, it's more about con convenience uh, and not predominantly about fairness and inclusion. And of course, one of the big opportunities with blockchain for those that are you know, vis visionaries or, or want the better is that blockchain can enable a fairer world, be it in finance, you know, in banking, or on the web, you know, web 3.0 should be fairer, right? Blockchain has that potential, but as, as Tayanak said, it's a question of who, uh, person, um, uh, corporate, 
uh, whatever entity takes and applies it and whether it actually makes it uh, happen. So it's, it's yet to be seen. There's a question for you, Sayamax, from uh, Mary Trips, as uh, uh, a board member of, uh, of Reload Chris. Um, do you think that Norblo Norblock's uh, market is winner take all? In which one of two blockchain ecosystems will dominate the uh, uh, know your customer space, or can multiply players survive? Uh, same question for other blockchain ecosystems, for example, IBM's Food Trust blockchain or food supply chain. Uh, it depends. If we are the winner, yes, it's winner takes all. Otherwise, it's going to be many winners. I'm joking, clearly. But basically, <laughs> basically, the key thing is that, yes, largely, it's winner takes all per jurisdiction. Though. So, for example, under a regulatory jurisdiction, utility can have up to one KYC ecosystem. The same as you can have one KYC utility. But between countries, Actually, there can be many winners in between different countries. You can have different companies, different protocols. And also the other thing that we should consider is the fact that you have ecosystems that are between banks, but also ecosystems that are within banks. So there are quite a few different ecosystems in size, but simply put within a jurisdiction, yes, it's largely winner takes all. Spot on. Uh, Very nice. If would you like to add uh, anything on that? No, I don't want to add. I mean, the the the, <laughs> the only thought I want to add to this, um, you know, if we look at the different protocols, right, that are out there and are competing, you know, there's Ethereum and there's Tezos and there's Cardano and those types of protocols at that layer. Uh, there is the valid question out there whether it's a winner take all or not or will we have multiple blockchains that are more domain uh, specific in different you know uh, areas i think it's early to say this it's even early to say whether um what will be the the um, um, sort of allocation between private and public blockchains for a while um you know, we would think that um, in the enterprise private world, the private blockchains will dominate. I am starting to, to doubt that. I think that there will be a healthy mix more than I thought before. So it's, for me, a thinking that is evolving. Thank you very much. I don't know if you have any thoughts around that. Yeah, so, so actually it's... Uh... So the, my answer was based on Norblox and yes. Norblox markets. Yep. When we look though, because if you touched upon a very big subject, which essentially is what blockchain protocol will prevail. Yep. And in enterprise blockchain, in Norblox we've worked with uh, Ethereum or Forum, uh, we've worked with Fabric and Corda. I mean, they all have the merits, the drawbacks, etc. And right now it's way too early to yep. determine which one uh, will win. And it may not be that winner takes all, even in protocols. But at the same time, the way we think about protocols is that they are like Android and iOS. You may have two, you cannot have 10. That's why I'm puzzled when even today I see companies that start having their own protocol. In an area that network effects are so strong, I think it's a bit too late in the game to create a new protocol nowadays. Very nice, very nice. Um, there is another question, uh, a bit more specialized for athletes for you, uh, which is uh, focusing on the stable coins and uh, wealth management. So, uh, what are your views on the DeFi lending platforms in the future? And also, what, um, also considering that today uh, we see them offering interest rates of 10% plus and lending rates. Uh, uh, as uh, low as 1%. Uh, are they engaging in a war with the traditional banking system? Okay, they are not engaging uh, in a war with the traditional banking system. I mean, the silo between them and, and the traditional world is, is really huge. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they are definitely operating within the, the pure 
native uh, crypto world uh, clearly. Um, so it, we're not there yet. Uh, I think, um, you know, it, the growth in the DeFi market has been quite uh, impressive over the past year, clearly, but still it's a very small market. It's starting to get in its size also crowded uh, and, and I don't think that it has room for so many uh, players. And um, we also have the fact that we are waiting to see how uh, big the proof of stake market uh, will, will become. Uh, waiting for the Ethereum 2.0 to, to be launched, that is going to make a, a big uh, difference. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that, you know, staking is something that is, is very sort of niche right now, extremely niche and not in, in the banking system. But the interest in this environment, in this macro environment, in understanding what staking is and how you earn interest in this um, uh, native uh, blockchain world, I think is very appealing. Um, and um, last but not least, there is a, a bit uh, a question addressed to both of you, which is for the wider, broader, uh, wider, wider sense of blockchain, uh, from Mike about the innovation and where the innovation is going to come from, uh, and where you see the mass adoption. I guess the the mass adoption is referred to the sectors. I'm not clear about the question actually. It's it's too too broad <laughs> a it, question. It, it is a little bit broad. I don't know if Mike wants to to uh, elaborate a little bit further on his question. Um, in the meantime, um, uh, if we give Mike some time, I would like to let you know that um, we have uh, allocated the rooms. So if you're happy for the networking, we'll start. Uh, uh, moving into the breakout rooms and you can continue the discussion uh, there. Um, I don't know, Kate, if we have any other questions from the Facebook uh, page, if you'd like to, to add them here. Hi, Veronique. There's no specific questions from the Facebook Live page. Okay, fantastic. Fantastic. So I guess uh, uh, it is worth uh, moving forward with the breakout session. Uh, I would like to thank you all uh, for this uh, webinar. It was a very interesting discussion. A lot of things were relatively new to me as well, uh, I guess, and uh, for, for most of the people. Um, so let me move on with the... Uh... It's the first time I'm doing it with the... <laughs> with the breakout rooms so let's yeah, see it, it, it will, it will work to stockholm please 